Greetings, and welcome to the commencement ceremony for the Penn State Law Class of 2022. This is one of the great days of a lifetime for our graduates, and we are pleased to be able to celebrate in person with family and friends. We also welcome the graduates, families, and friends who are joining us remotely via live stream. While this day is one of joy and celebration, 
The commencement ceremony itself calls for dignity and decorum. Therefore, we request everyone's cooperation in according this ceremony the quiet respect it deserves. Please take a moment to ensure the ringtone on your cell phone is off. Please also remain from moving around the auditorium during the ceremony, including for photos. We have arranged to have photos taken of graduates as they walk across the stage when their names are read. Thank you for your cooperation and understanding. I now declare this convocation open. Would everyone please rise for the pro processional and the singing of the national anthem.
please remain standing for the national anthem, which will be sung by two members of the graduating class of 2022, JD candidate Kara J. Scully and Demetra Dentis. Good morning, please be seated. I am delighted to welcome everybody here this morning to the commencement ceremony for the class of 2022 of Penn State Law. We often an occasion like this say that it's good to see you and we mean it when we say that, but it's really good to see you this morning. Not only the graduates, but family and friends who are here as well. Those of you who are graduating today have by any measure accomplished something very significant in your lives. But the circumstances under which you've accomplished it are even all the more impressive. Our JD class of 2022, during their second semester of their first year of law school, began their dance with COVID. And for the next two years, remote, hybrid, mask, they did law school the COVID way. And thankfully at the end, you got to come out of that tunnel with a sense of normalcy. For our international students in our LLM class of 2022, you all had similar but a different set of challenges, never knowing if you were going to get here fighting with visas, fighting with travel restrictions. And when you finally did get here into a new country, in some cases having to be isolated and be by yourselves. And we have today also graduating our first class of Masters of Legal Studies graduates, a new degree that we are offering. And you are pioneers in this project. And we thank you for entering that journey with us and for your achievement in doing that. For all of you, as you go forward, all you, di you didn't choose the adventure of the past few years. I hope you use it. I hope you use the toughness that you've learned. And I hope you use the extra measure of empathy that you've earned and learned during these past couple of years. And that as you go forward, you'll look back on this time with a measure of, believe it or not, fondness. We all know that you don't get to this point without the help of others and that you have family and friends who have loved you and supported you and occasionally given you tough love to help you get to this moment. And I would ask that you all, those of you sitting in the front rows, would join me in enthusiastic applause for your family and friends here and on the live stream. Thank you for that. Last but certainly not least are the people that went through this journey with you, people that helped put on the program from which you now graduate, our faculty, 
our administrators and our staff who dealt with their own challenges during the past several years and who have been, in, been here day in and day out to put on the program that we hope will launch you into your new careers. Please join me in thanking our faculty, administrators, and staff. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Executive Vice President and Provost of the Pennsylvania State University, Dr. Nicholas P. Jones. As the Chief Academic Officer of Penn State, Dr. Jones is responsible for the administration of Penn State's vast educational and research programs. His work supports thousands of faculty, more than 90,000 students at Penn State's 25 campuses, including University Park, the Commonwealth campuses, and the online World Campus Program. Dr. Jones came to Penn State in July of 2013 from Johns Hopkins University where he served as the Benjamin T. Rome Dean of the Whiting School of Engineering and previously as Professor and Chairman of Civil Engineering. He holds an MS degree and a PhD degree in Civil Engineering from the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, and previously earned his undergraduate degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Dr. Jones is a leader who appreciates the rule of law and also understands the role of a law school on the central campus of a great university. And it's my distinct pleasure and honor and ask that you join me in welcoming Dr. Jones this morning. Well, thank you, Dean Houck. Uh, it is certainly an honor to share this special day with our graduates, their families, and friends. A day of celebration, achievement, and recognition. And this year's celebration does feel particularly special. To all our graduating students, I commend you for your perseverance, resilience, and your commitment to learning during an educational experience that has been truly like no other. Take pride in your success and always know how proud we are of all of you. Everyone, please join me in applauding this exceptional group of Penn State learners. Thank you. Today, we honor an impressive group of students that has contributed enormously to the intellectual and civic life of our university community. You have contributed significantly toward Penn State's work to impact the world and solve important societal problems. You have provided access to justice, help people better understand legal issues, and participated in interdisciplinary teams to support entrepreneurship, veterans' health, security, and digital innovation, among others. All of you made sacrifices and studied long and hard to get to this day. Your spouses, families, and friends have also worked hard, and I join Dean Houck in offering our recognition and appreciation. On behalf of Penn State, thank you, family, friends, faculty, and staff. Let's give them all another round of applause. <laughs> Class of 2022, you have demonstrated that you can help move this nation and indeed the world forward, and your skills and expertise are greatly needed. You are ready to take your place in the legal community and to serve with intelligence, integrity, and honor. As you transition to the ranks of Penn State Law alumni, you will join a distinguished group of Penn State attorneys, judges, legislators, scholars, and business leaders. Our hopes for you are very high, as are our expectations. I am confident that you all will contribute to this world 
in positive ways and that you will continue to make us proud. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Each year, two students are chosen by their peers to make remarks at commencement. We will first hear from LLM degree candidate Celine Onur. Celine is from Istanbul, Turkey, and graduated from Mamara University Law School in the fall of 2019. In Turkey, Celine is an attorney focusing on corporate law and international arbitration. During her time at Penn State Law, she served as a research assistant to Professor Tom Carboneau and Professor Bethany Scholes. Celine also played an active role in coaching Penn State Law's Viz Moot court team this year. She's passionate about using law as a tool for empowering women and for creating a more sustainable future. Please welcome Celine Nur. Greetings, Penn State Law, faculty and staff, family and friends, fellow graduates, class of 2022. It is an honor for me to address all of you today. Thank you for being here and celebrating with us. First of all, I would like to congratulate and thank everyone that has been part of this journey, including our fellow LLM and JD graduates. I remember the very first day we all met at Sunset Park. We were friendly, but still unfamiliar faces to each other back then. And there was this endless game of guesses, where in the world people are originated from. And let me tell you something, it was hard, because we are from 28 different countries, from five different continents, from all over the world. Then, after we settled in the Happy Valley, we got to know each other better. We smiled wide, and embraced each other whenever we saw it. We shared our meals and celebrated our fasts and birthdays together. We learned from our differences and inspired each other every day. We also realized how similar our concerns, struggles, and hopes are. When everything became overwhelming, we were there to support and lift each other. We evolved and became better versions of ourselves. These last nine months have been a once-in-a-lifetime experience. What made it so special is that, regardless of our differences, we always respected each other and celebrated the diversity amongst us. It has been a privilege to become a part of this international family. The more I got to know everyone, the more I believe in a better future where we can be the change we wish to see in the world. As we go into the world, take a piece of each other of these experiences, of the culture and memories we have created here into your lives, no matter where you end up. Before beginning this journey, we were not even sure whether we would make it here or not. And now this chapter is coming to an end. Life brings us other challenges and adventures. We should be aware by now that there are and will be always uncertainties. It is how life is. There is no need to rush, because there is nothing right or perfect. We will work hard, but be kind. At, we will pave our own ways in life. In fact, many of us already have. Some fellow graduates have been admitted to SJD programs. Some have signed their job contracts, and some have st started to study for the bar. Please. Invest in the importance of this moment and cherish it. Enjoy and trust the journey. We know that we can do anything we set our minds to. So let us move on and make reality of our dreams. Class of 2022, we are the present and future of Penn State Law. Thank you. Thank you, Celine, for those 
wonderful and heartfelt remarks. It is now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our special guest speaker this morning, the Honorable Theodore A. McKee, United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and formerly the Chief Judge of the Third Circuit. Judge McKee has a long and distinguished legal career characterized by a truly impressive record of public service. He was nominated for the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in 1994 by President Bill Clinton and served as Chief Judge of the Court from 2010 to 2016. Before being nominated to the Third Circuit, Judge McKee was elected to a 10-year term as a judge of the Court of Common Pleas for the First Judicial District of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, where he also chaired the Pennsylvania Sentencing Commission. Judge McKee began his legal career at a large Philadelphia law firm before leaving to begin his career in public service. Since then, he has been an assistant United States attorney, deputy solicitor to the law department of the city of Philadelphia, and general counsel to the Philadelphia Parking Authority. In addition to this remarkable list of accomplishments, Judge McKee's commitment to public service is also evident in his many other recognition and achievements, which include the Board of Visitors of Temple Law School and of Syracuse University Law School, his alma mater, the American Law Institute's project to revise the sentencing provisions of the Model Penal Code, the Criminal Law Committee of the United States Judicial Conference, the National Academy of Science Committee on Law and Justice, the Council on Criminal Justice, and the board of the Rendell Center for Civics and Civic Engagement. Judge McKee earned his law degree from Syracuse College of Law in 1975, graduating magna cum laude. Also joining us this morning is Judge McKee's wife, Dr. Anna Pulhos, and also with Dr. Pulhos is our chairman of our Penn State Law Advisory Board, former chief judge of the U.S. Third Circuit Court of Appeals, and currently distinguished jurist in residence at Penn State Law, the Honorable D. Brooks Smith. Thank you, Judge Smith and Dr. Pulhos for being with us. And now, would you all please join me in welcoming Judge Theodore McKee. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. It's uh, an amazing day, I know, for all of you. As I listened to uh, Ms. Onur, I don't quite know her well enough to call her Celia and Saline, never met her, in fact. Uh, I was struck by one thing she said, and that was that you are the future of, of Penn State University, but it's more than that. The graduates today, in, in no small way uh, do I mean this, you're really the future of us, of all of us, because you have a legal training which is so important, and I want to spend my time today talking to uh, you about that. Uh, I thank all of you for allowing me the honor of addressing you here today. I especially want to thank the dean, my incredibly dear and cherished friend and colleague, uh, Judge Smith, who um, is now a senior judge, not as active as he used to be, but I still cannot imagine life on the Third Circuit without my friend uh, nearby to send emails, which I hope will never ever see the light of day back and forth, but it's a pleasure to be here and spend time uh, with him. Uh, the Dean spoke about the rule of law, and um, the more I thought about what I should say to you today, the more I realized the need to impress upon you the importance of the rule of law and the threat that it is now under, and the threat that the democratic form of government that we take for granted, and that you have spent so many hours studying, is now in peril. Before I proceed, however, it's very important that I emphasize to you that as I stand here today speaking to you, I'm not speaking as a judge, but as a fellow citizen, a very concerned and frightened fellow citizen. My remarks are not intended to be political or to favor any political party. I merely want to put events into their historical and legal perspective. I'm trying to break through the noise, innuendo, rumor, lies, and misinformation that have begun to shape and define our political discourse, and even actually, sadly, our government, and which, if allowed to fester, will fundamentally undermine and destroy this democracy. My purpose is not to make you feel hopeless or impart cynicism, although I tend to be a bit cynical at times, <clears throat> but to help you understand how urgent it is that you get involved, each of you, and work to make a difference. It has been said that democracy cannot exist without lawyers. 
And while I agree that lawyers are necessary to a thriving democracy, they are not sufficient to ensure the success of a republic government. It is my hope that each of will, you will use your education, your intellect, and your strength to strengthen this country and push back against those who are trying so hard to undermine it for their own self-interested and selfish purposes. Wherever you end up, do not just go along to get along. You know, it's easy for me to say I'm at the, kind of the end of my career. I don't have to worry about career advancements or anything like that. But today, I want you, each of you to ask yourself, as you leave here, what kind of lawyer do you want to be? Before the pressures accumulate of mortgage payments and car payments and family <coughs> and obligations uh, and billable hours and whether or not you're going to make partner if you're at a, a firm, ask yourself, what kind of a lawyer do I want to be? And more importantly, what kind of a person do I want to be? And I would suggest to you that the answer to that latter question will inform the firmer, former. If you decide what kind of a person you want to be, you will know what kind of a lawyer you want to be. I don't mind sharing uh, with you that as I began to look deeper into the events surrounding January 6, 2021, its background and its aftermath, I became cons increasingly concerned, even frightened, and that's not an overstatement, about where we are, where we as a country are headed. For the first time in our history, an armed mob stormed the Capitol to prevent the peaceful transfer of power something the United States has historically been renowned for throughout the world, the method by which we have the peaceful transfer of power. I cannot overemphasize that if we do not learn from the events of January 6th and the atmosphere that increasingly surrounds political campaigns and elections, and now engulfs even school boards, if you can imagine such a thing, local school boards who are demanding police protection to meet and discuss policies surrounding children's education, the country your children and grandchildren will inherit will bear precious little resemblance to the one which we have grown up in. Indeed, we may not um, have to wait for the future generations to see the end of representative democracy as we have known it. And that is not just my view. In his recent book, a former attorney general of the United States asked the following questions. How do we save democracy before it's too late? A former Attorney General of the United States expresses his fear for the future of democracy in this country. How in the hell did we get here? It is tempting to trace today's institutional tensions to January 6, but they did not begin there. For example, during the 2008 presidential primary season, a candidate who had previously held a leadership position in Congress and who held a strong position in the polls for a substantial period of time during the presidential primary stated on national TV that if he were elected president, he would send U.S. Marshals or police to arrest judges who issue, quote, controversial decisions. And I assume that means anything he didn't agree with. He boasted that he would, use, he would force those judges to appear before Congress and explain their decisions, which is ironic because this gentleman was a professor in history and taught at a very prestigious uh, academic institution before he uh, was ran for Congress. So I would assume that he knows that judges write these things called opinions, where we in fact explain our reasoning. He also proclaimed that if elected, he would order his national security personnel to disobey any order of the Supreme Court that he deemed inconsistent with the nation's security. And now whether or not he was serious, he apparently was not that concerned about suggesting he would initiate such a regime and the national mood was such that he thought he could safely conclude that the political benefits of such statements outweighed whatever risk he might incur. And perhaps he was right. Several years ago, the University of Connecticut conducted a State of the First Amendment survey in an attempt to assess how Americans viewed the Bill of Rights, and their findings are less than reassuring. They concluded that 34% of all Americans polled said that the First Amendment goes too far. 46% said there was too much freedom of the press. 28% felt that newspapers should not be able to publish articles without prior approval of the government. Now those numbers may be somewhat skewed because the poll was taken shortly after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 and we're all feeling the collective threat from an outside source. But I ask you, the fundamental liberties that are guaranteed by the Bill of Rights are contingent upon current events, 
and external circumstances and our own feeling of security, are they as fundamental to our legal system as we would like to believe? And I would say for all of you the core Matsu decision to suggest that maybe they are a lot more flexible than we like to think they are. Moreover, our commitment to fundamental liberties and the rule of law simply has to be questioned after the events of January 6, 2021. In that vein, I urge each of you to carefully read the published study of the demographics of those who actually entered the Capitol building on January 6. It was conducted by the two decades old project on suicide terrorism at the University of Chicago. The project has spent more than 30 years studying political violence and is focused on terrorism and propaganda, so it's not just a reaction to January 6. The study concludes that of those who actually breached the Capitol building, who went inside, 24% were business owners, 28% held white collar jobs, and although much press has focused on those with military backgrounds or those who wore insignia from certain fringe militia groups, 90% had no prior experience with any militia group or the military whatsoever. They came from 44 states as well as the District of Columbia. Most of them actually came from counties that Biden had won. In fact, the higher the percentage of county vote that the Republican candidate won, the lower the percentage of insurrectionists from that county. A poll taken of 40,000 randomly selected adults between September 24 and September 27 of 2021 and extrapolated to the general population of the United States with a confidence level of plus or minus 2.9%, so it's a high level of certainty, concluded the following. 10% or 25 million Americans believe force is justified to restore the former president to the White House. 24%, 62 million Americans believe the current president is illegitimate. And perhaps most frightening of all, 21 million Americans believe both that the current president is illegitimate and force is justified to restore the prior president to the White House. That is slightly less than one out of every four Americans. Now think about that for a second. One out of every four Americans believes both the current president is illegitimate and the force is justified to restore the prior president to the White House. <coughs> the report concludes that of those 21 million, they are active, they are dangerous, and have the potential for even greater growth in numbers. One of the key findings was that the 21 million are not fading. To quote from the report, one might expect that 9.3 months after January 6, when this report was being released, interest would naturally fade, arresting more than 650 participants would have a chilling effect, and deplatforming one of the major proponents of the claim that the former president won the one would de-energize support for the violent restoration of his presidency. None of those assumptions is true. In fact, the size, the 21 million, is large and stable with significant growth potential. It may well continue to grow with the coming election season, and perhaps most frightening, frightening, it concluded, there is a large mass of kindling waiting for an incendiary moment. This is the society that you will be entering with your law degree. Now, it may surprise you to know that in one of the Nuremberg trials I recently read about, those who were convicted of crimes against humanity included a dentist, a university professor, an opera singer, a Protestant pastor, a teacher, and even a few journalists. They were not unlike the ordinary citizens that Milton Mayer describes in an extraordinary book, and I urge you to read it, entitled, They Thought They Were Free. In that book, Mayer uh, shares the conclusions he drew after taking up residence in a small German town he calls Konenberg, shortly after World War II, in an effort to explain how an institutionalized democratic republic could have allowed the seeds of authoritarianism to, de to, to develop as they did in pre-war Germany. Now, there are obvious limitations in attempting to compare pre-war Germany with the United States today. It is far from a perfect analogy, and you should not interpret my comments as suggesting that the social and structural infirmities that led to the decline of the Weimar Republic could necessarily allow a similar collapse here. Nece uh, not, nevertheless, Mara's study illustrates the importance of informed and caring involvement in all levels of government. Mayor's study includes something about the perpetrators of the violence in Germany. Those who were actually involved in the brutality were indistinguishable as a group from those who were not. 
This conclusion was corroborated many years later when in 2008, the international edition of the German magazine Spiegel contained an article with the following heading, Everyday Murder, Nazi Atrocities Committed by Ordinary People. The article summarized then recent studies about the people who carried out atrocities in the name of the German state. They were a cross-section of society, not a collection of criminals or psychopaths, as one might surmise. I thought about that article as I read the studies about who was involved in the violence of January 6th. They were our neighbors. David Frum said much of the same thing in an article appearing in the Atlantic magazine. He recently warned, populist-fueled democratic backsliding is difficult to counter. He continues, it could happen here too. If people retreat into private life, if critics grow quieter, if cynicism becomes endemic, if knowledge is dis displaced by the noise of media outlets, more concerned with inflaming viewers and stoking fears and anger than the accuracy of reporting, then the corruption will slowly become more brazen and intimidation of opponents stronger, laws intended to ensure accountability or prevent graft or protect civil liberties will be weakened. And consistent with Brougham's warnings about the dangers of complacency, noted political theorist Hannah Arendt wrote many years ago, the sad truth is that most evil is done by people who never make up their minds to do good or evil. The October 28, uh, 2011 edition of the Boston Globe, in that edition, Samuel Arbison discusses a survey of the duration of various republics. He used a data set spanning over 3,000 years to create a statistical model which includes everything from the Babylonian Empire of ancient Mesopotam Mesopotamia to the Byzantine Empire and even the Roman Empire. He concludes that the average lifetime of a republic is 215 years. The republic established under our constitution is approximately 230 years old. When viewed through the lens of history, our participatory democracy may already be living on borrowed time. Now, of course, it can be argued that the advances in technology and mass communication mean that the model he used should not be applied to modern republics. But I submit to you the opposite may also be true. Our access to information and knowledge may exacerbate the danger, not mitigate it. The proliferation of misinformation and so-called fake news has made it easier to spread lies. Just think about how many Americans truly believe the current president lost the 2020 election. The belief is fueled by advances in modern technology that can put information at a competitive disadvantage to misinformation because the latter can exploit the energy and passion of rumor fueled by inflamed emotions. There's a sad irony here that would be absolutely hilarious if it were not so extraordinarily sad and dangerous. In fact, this might otherwise be fodder for a skit in Saturday Night Live. As many of you know, the manufacturer of the voting machines used in the last election <clears throat> brought a $1.3 billion defamation suit against one of the former president's lawyers for statements she made about the accuracy of those machines and questioning whether or not they, were, uh, they had accurately counted the vote. The plaintiff, the manufacturer of the machines, argued that those statements had injured the company's reputation. The defendant's attorney responded uh, by actually filing a motion in which they argued that the suit should be dismissed because, and I'm quoting from the motion, no reasonable person would conclude that the statements were truly statements of fact, close quote. And therefore, the motion argued, the plaintiff could not prove the damages necessary to prevail in a defamation suit. That was their argument. And yet, here we are 20 million people later sitting on a pile of kindling. Anger is far more powerful a motivator than reason, and inflamed emotions aren't good at listening to opposing views. Historically, the one institution that has enjoyed the respect of the substantial majority of Americans is the Supreme Court. The court and the federal judiciary have long been viewed as being above politics, and our pronouncements have been accepted, if only grudgingly. Where are we now? Given the politicalization process of nominating Supreme Court justices or not holding hearings for them, as well as the conduct of any hearings, will courts still be accepted as being apolitical? In addition, no matter what any of us may think about the merits of the competing sides of the debate around abortion and the right to privacy, 
the leaked draft of the Supreme Court opinion has inflicted profound damage on the court and the public acceptance of the uh, concept of an independent judiciary. In 2001, about two weeks after the Twin Trade Tower bombings, I was asked to speak to the Council of the Russian Judiciary in Moscow about the importance of an independent judiciary. Uh, the Council of the Russian Judiciary was, at the time, the governing body of Russian judges. It was very analogous to our United States um, Judicial Conference. It was composed of 200 judges from around the country of, um, of Russia. I used my time there to focus on the significance of the Supreme Court's decision in the Watergate tapes case in 1974. And I, I realize I'm dating myself, and probably none of the graduates, though many in the audience, remember the Watergate uh, case in 1974, although hopefully you've read about it. It was a case that grew out of the special prosecutor's attempt to find out, uh, to prosecute those people involved in the Watergate break-in. But also part of that became an inquiry into what the president knew, and to quote one of the senator's words, when he knew it. During the course of the hearings into that inquiry, it became known that there was a recording system in the Oval Office that recorded all of the conversations and phone calls in the Oval Office. The special prosecutor subpoenaed the tapes from those recordings in an attempt to find out the extent to which, if at all, the president was involved in the break-in or in the subsequent uh, cover-up. The president's lawyers told, filed a motion to quash the subpoena. It went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And a unanimous decision eight to zero because one of the justices, Justice Rehnquist, recused himself having served in the Nixon administration. Eight to zero, the court held that Nixon had to hand over the tapes. The opinion was written by Chief Justice Warren Burger, who was a Nixon appointee. Four of the eight justice who signed, justices who signed the majority opinion were Nixon appointees. 16 days after that opinion was filed, Nixon resigned from office. When I explained that to the group, after the discussion, a couple of the judges came up to me, and this is all through interpreters, of course, and they said they didn't understand how could that possibly be, and one of them actually asked me, why would the president step down merely because the court ordered him to? And I said, well, he really had no alternative because of the culture of compliance, as I like to call it. The, the culture is such that when the court speaks, it has such acceptance and respect a president is not going to be able to resist, and the public outcry that would follow, if he did resist, would be unbearable. He had to resign. And then one of the judges looked at me and said, maybe I misunderstand the American system. As I understand it, the Supreme Court does not command any battalions. And I said, well, that's, that's right. And uh, he said, well, then why, why would the president step down? I said, because of the public opinion. And the other judge literally laughed at me and goes, you don't understand. The president can shape public opinion. And I said, well, not if there's a free press. And the other one said, well, that's a big if, because who knows if there's going to be a free press. Maybe the press will help the president shape public opinion the way he wants it to come out. I can't tell you how many times I've thought about that presentation and the little sidebar I had with those two Russian judges afterwards. I walked away thinking, my God, how naive these people are. I now think to myself, how naive I was as I see what's unfolding here. Does anyone here believe that if an analogous judicial ruling in, uh, were to come down in the future, that compliance with it would automatically follow? But I don't want to be too cynical here today. I believe this time to turn this around. The die is not yet cast, and the constitutional Rubicon has not yet been crossed. But things won't get back on track without the caring and informed participation of each of you no matter what kind of law you practice, and even if you use your incredibly valuable and useful law degree in some area other than practicing law, make a difference. And this goes back to what I said earlier about asking yourself the kind of person, the kind of lawyer that you want to be. Whether you seek a position on your local school board, which is really needed these days, your local, state, or federal legislature, make a difference. For those of you who are or will be raising families, teach your children to care, teach them to think, perhaps most importantly, teach them how to think independently using reason and fact, not emotion or unsubstantiated rumor. Something is not necessarily true just because it's seen on, on television. In closing, I leave you with uh, two thoughts. First, I want to quote the noted anthropologist Margaret Mead who said, never doubt that a handful of committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. You can determine the direction of that change because it can go in either direction. 
Second, I want to share a story that is part of the culture of a wonderful volunteer organization called City Year, which some of you may be familiar with. I believe there's a chapter now in Pittsburgh. It's a parable about a little girl walking on the beach after a ferocious storm has washed hundreds, maybe thousands of starfish onto the beach. The sun has come out and the starfish are beginning to dry out and die. She dutifully begins walking along the beach, picking them up and throwing them back into the ocean. <coughs> a man who is nearby reading a newspaper and sees what she's doing walks over to her and goes, little girl, what are you doing? There must be thousands of starfish here. You cannot possibly make a difference. She looked at the starfish she was holding in her hand, tossed it back into the water and said, I made a difference to that one. Well, you can make a difference to that one wherever you are. So thank you so much for allowing me to share this time with you today. And wherever you go, whatever you do, make a difference to that one. Thank you. Thank you, Judge McKee, for those inspiring remarks. We are honored that you are here with us today. Now we turn to the Board of Trustees, the legal corporate body of the Pennsylvania State University. This is the body that, by our charter, is given final responsibility for the governance, welfare, and all other interests pertaining to the university. At this time, I call upon Trustee M. Abraham Harpster to authorize the conferring of degrees at this ceremony. Abe was elected to the Board of Trustees by delegates from the Agricultural Society's effective July 2013. He graduated from Penn State in 1994 with a bachelor's degree in Agricultural Business Management from the College of Agricultural Sciences. The co-owner of Evergreen Farms Incorporated in Spruce Creek, Pennsylvania, Abe has served in agricultural associations at the local, state, and national levels. We are very pleased that he is with us today. Trustee Harpster. Good morning. It is my pleasure to join with you today in the celebration of your graduation from Penn State Law. I welcome this opportunity to be with you, your families and friends, both in person as well as those joining us remotely, to mark your achievements, accomplishments, and years of hard work. Provost Jones, by virtue of the authority vested in the Board of Trustees of the Pennsylvania State University, and on behalf of the board, I authorize you to confer on each of these candidates the degree earned as certified by the faculty. Thank you very much, Trustee Harpster. We now turn to the conferral of degrees. For each degree recipient, whether participating in person or remotely, a slide will be displayed on the video screen behind the stage. Those who are here in person will walk across the stage when recognized. We will begin with the degree of Master of Legal Studies. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Legal Studies please rise? help advance their careers. The program introduces students to U.S. jurisprudence and affords them the opportunity to focus on areas of the law of particular interest or which have particular relevance to their broader career goals. These 2022 graduates enrolled in the fall of 2021 and are the first to earn this newly established degree. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and upon the authorization of the University Board of Trustees, I hereby admit each of you to the degree of Master of Legal Studies. Congratulations.
we will now turn to the Master of Laws. Will the candidates for the degree Master of Laws please rise? In 1968, a Master of Laws program in comparative law designed for international students was adopted and it continues to this day as a mainstay of the Penn State Law academic program. The LLM program, a one-year course of study which integrates LLM students into the legal program offered to our JD students, is designed to provide foreign trained lawyers a strong foundation in US law. Since its inception, students from approximately 50 different countries have earned the LLM degree and have gone on to make significant national and international contributions. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and upon the authorization of the University Board of Trustees, I hereby admit each of you to the degree of Master of Laws. Congratulations. Please be seated. Next, we turn to the degree of Juris Doctor. Will the candidates for the degree of Juris Doctor please rise? The Juris Doctor degree program is a three-year, six-semester course of study through which students are taught fundamental principles of law in a wide variety of core and advanced topics and learn to engage in legal analysis, reasoning, and problem solving, to perform legal research, to communicate effectively orally and in writing regarding legal matters, and to recognize and resolve ethical issues and to discharge professional responsibilities within the legal system. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and upon the authorization of the University Board of Trustees, I hereby admit each of you to the degree of Juris Doctor. Congratulations. <laughs> Please be seated. We will now recognize each of these degree recipients by name. I call upon Dean Engel to announce each name beginning with the Master of Legal Studies. When I call your name, please come forward. Sammy Al Shamri <laughs> Tiffany M. Ayola. Haley Hartman. Farouk Ali Khan. Abby Rose London. Linda L. Hondo. Matthew John Salomoni.
Angie Zhang. I will now read the name of each recipient of the degree of Master of Laws. When I call your name, please come forward. Islambek, Bahodir, Ogli, Abdik Hakimov. Nodirahan, Morad Konova, Abdurakmanova. Imalka, Priyadarshani, Kumari, Abessiner. Fulashayu, Oluwatoyan, Abiyudin. Aditi Yiarini. Aditi Yiarini. <laughs> Joseph Ikena Agbowo. Chiamelia, Michael, Agu. <laughs> Natasha, Ilavati. <laughs> Hamza, Hamid, A, Algamdi. Muhannad Aref S. Al Gandhi. <laughs> Abdullah Nasser A. Al Hakbani. <laughs> Hamad Abdulaziz H. Alhatim <laughs> Ahmad Omar Saleh Al Jaidi <laughs> Fahad Abdulaziz Fahad M. Al Fahad Mutab N. Amutairi. <laughs> Abdul Rahman Abdul Ramid A. Al Nam. <laughs> Samira Sharaf R. Al Nafani. Muhammad Mubarak O Al Saimi <laughs> Bushra Jaber S Alotaibi <laughs> Mansur Durham G Alotaibi Saud Muhammad A. Alotaibi <laughs> Fahad Sulaiman S. Alufi <laughs> Nura Abdulaziz 
A. Arafa. <laughs> Mother, Abdullah A. Alsawil. <laughs> Abdullah Saleh M. Alshagayan. <laughs> Arwa Mohammed A. Alshamrani. Abdullah Alshankiti. <laughs> Abdullah Ali Hissen Alsulami. <laughs> Arwa Abdullah M. Alzarani. <laughs> Hatiji. Kubra Arslan <laughs> Afnan Saad Y Asiri <laughs> Naran Setieg Badark <laughs> Ibrahim Abdullah Z A Abdulatif Badawi <laughs> Raed Mohammed A. Beobed <laughs> Mohammed Abdullah Saeed Basar <laughs> Kevin Anawe Bawa <laughs> Elmira Alvandi Bahini <laughs> Daniel Boadi <laughs> Paulina Eugenia Boatrago Sueto <laughs> Jinzuan Zai <laughs> Ch Chaya Yu Zhang <laughs> Goong Chen Chihuswan Chen <laughs> Ethan Chetty <laughs> Ziyu Chiu <laughs> Kai Di <laughs> Valeria Delgado Moreno <laughs> Sanskriti Desai <laughs> Reem Duadi Camila Diaz Cano Bellido <laughs> Pedup Dukpa <laughs> La Visa Aiken <laughs> Kutz Enkbeir Selmeg, Enter. <laughs> Eliza, Lily, and Manja. <laughs> Z.
zero fun. Rodita Fidelino. Per Benjamin Slagsvold Funk. Alberto Andres Garcia Barreto. Kasahan Delbach Gebra Mariam. Macy Guau. Malad Hamidi. Katinka Winther Yelt. Judith Ingela Rickertsen Ole. Sajo Jame. Archili Javekishvili. Priyanshi Kashyap Joshi. Joel and Amona Joshua. Kemletbek Rajab Ugli. Kadarov. Aminata Kita. Sardor Humdomov. Zara Herulayeva. Mariam Farid Hwaja. <laughs> Roland Kuspan. <laughs> Matteo Latore Ruiz De Lucianos. Evan Arwick Langseth. <laughs> Kung Lee. <laughs> Rinze Lee. <laughs> Sha'anwan Lee. Xiaojun Li. Chong Liu. Alebek Medebekov. Haersh Monohar. Abzal Menlebekov. <laughs> Nikita Mitu. <laughs> Saad Mohammed S. Mofare. <laughs> Luisa. Morales de Peva. Shomita Mukurji.
Miag Marsorin, Mangbatar. <laughs> Kusana, Nana Yakiera. Nikola Ventislavov Nedinov Chisum Augustine Okuini Waamaka Edna Okoye Celine Onor <laughs> Stephanie Pierina Perez Guardova <laughs> Gabriel Emilio Finada Aloha. Geobrina, Tari, Puntia. Shubem, Raheya. Atif, Rahman. Olo Murad Rajabov <laughs> Masharbek Rahimov <laughs> Henrik Lingver Ramstad <laughs> Ingrid Elena Reyes Palmera <laughs> Nabila Rubeat <laughs> Rustamboy Kuvandik Ugly Rustamuk <laughs> Shakzad Komorodovic Salokov Preeti, Sibaruth. <laughs> Mariam, Sefolahe. <laughs> Saraswati, Shah. <laughs> Shobam, Sharma. Utkarsh Sharma Gabriela Sealshi Giagie Sung Shaha Jamil Suror Shamhevi Tiwari Yasin Ilyev Tushev Yavor Ilyev Tushev Shirzad Shakurovich Toshpulatov Shazoda Tuchiva Samira 
Dale Pilar Velis Labo Labado. Gabriella Clara Voloschin. <laughs> Duo Hongzi Wang. <laughs> Mengna Wang. <laughs> Mingjie Wang. Ingrid Sufi Stangabai Wenzel. <laughs> Routing Wu. <laughs> Yijun Xiong. <laughs> Lujia Yu. Jing Chung Zhang In phone Zhang I will now read the name of each recipient of the degree of Juris Doctor. When I call your name, please come forward. Christopher Ellsworth Ansel Jr. <laughs> Brian Scott Axler. <laughs> Jennifer Grace Barker. <laughs> James Dean. Benitez the third Andrew Benison Alicia Burgett Jacob Beast Brandon A. Black. <laughs> Johanna R. Blazak. <laughs> Michael C. Brackney. <laughs> Caitlin M. Briggs <laughs> Megan E. Brightfield <laughs> Shirai Bryan <laughs> James R. Burns Grace A. Canfield. <laughs> Simon X. Cow. <laughs> Julia Ann Costanzo. <laughs> Alexis B. Castillo. Alexis E. Castronovo. Jacqueline Sapika. Daniel Stephen Clark. Patrick J. Clausen.
Matthew S. Collins. Robert J. Cooper. Thomas Joseph Crociata. Joseph L. DeGeneres. Jake J. DeLears. Demetra Dentis. Daniel DC. Hannah Dillard. Aaron Nicole Dingle. Cole M. Dorsey. Brianna M. Duggins. <laughs> Jenna Ebersbacher. Alex Felt. Morgan Renee Farrell. Eli W. Fields. Haley E. Feingold. Diego E. Garcia. Julia R. Gentili. Jeremy Nathan Glasner. Noah T. Gokenauer. Jane Wu Gong. Jared Matthew Good. Bristol Gunderson. Morgan R. Harrington. Cassidy Ray Hatton. Reed Christopher Hennessy. Ashley Lauren Heron. Joshua R. Hicks. Emma J. Hoffman. Lindsay Aaron Hopper. Ayana Miyako Seku. Humphrey. Michaela D. Hyams. Michael Ingracia. 
Mitchell J. Jagodinsky. Stefan Bergman Johansson. Blair Alexandra Johnson. Melissa C. Johnston. Bria Noel Jones. Shane T. Kalashevsky. Joy Kim. Michael Thomas Conan. Michaela Joan Koski. Christy L. Kozlowski. Alicia Lynn Kranz. Diane Twe Jang Lei. Chow Mei Li. Morgan R. Leftwich. Mason B. Leg. Shannon E. Leininger. Kimberly M. Lennox. Brenda Rosario Loeza. Aaliyah M. Lull. Haley G. Loquarcio. Timothy F. Mangan. Nicholas V. Martiniano. Megan E. McClement. Brittany Nicole McCracken. Maria Elena McCuskey. Sydney Tyler Corinne McDonald. Megan A. McGovern. Garvey McKee. Zachary Mills. Patrick J. Missal. Skyler R. Morgan. Francis Andrew Mulligan. Matthew James Nickel.
Jonathan Nucci. Connor O'Donnell. Natalie Olivero Ramirez. Melanie Mwango Ouma. D. Park. Abigail Lynn Parnell. Ashley N. Passarello. Ashwani H. Patel. Mira Y. Patel. Elizabeth Ann Patterson. Molly K. Paulhouse. Keenan J. Rambo. David Lawrence Randolph the Fourth. Jordan C. Roan. Sarah. C. Reardon. Emery Scott Robertson. Grace K. Romploski. Yi Rong. Rachel H. Rousseau Shander. Adam Michael Rudder. Connor M. Shea. Caroline C. Scath. Carajoy Skelly. Corinne M. Smith. Tyson Smith. Ginger L. Snap. Sawyer Sourbeer. Courtney A. Stevens. Audrey E. Thompson. Gabrielle Dominique Talk. Shivangi Tomar.
Dominic V. Trader. Katherine Grace Turner. Haley Marie Walker. Benjamin Lafayette Tyler Wallace. Hanching Wang. How you Wong Grace Madeline Ward Austin A. Watrous Kirsten Watson Carter Westfall Thomas Woodward Anthony J. Zorillo the Third Sierra Elizabeth Zellner. Taylor A. Zellman. Andrew John Zerby. Jesse Nathaniel Zielinski. Assembled guests, it is my distinct honor to present to you the Penn State Law Class of 2022. <laughs> and now on behalf of the Penn State Alumni Association, I am delighted to welcome each member of the class of 2022 into one of the largest, most effective, loudest alumni networks on the face of the earth. <laughs> we urge you during this promising and challenging next year to stay connected to Penn State law and connected to your university and to other Penn Staters and the Alumni Association is a way to do that. To help you do that, the Alumni Association gives you a gift each year, a one-year free membership in the Penn State Alumni Association. Your membership keeps you in touch with Penn State and connects you with more than 300 alumni groups throughout the United States and around the world. And it includes automatic membership in the Penn State Law Alumni Society. So congratulations into your induction into the Penn State Alumni Association and the Penn State Law Alumni Society. I'm now happy to introduce Skylar Morgan. <laughs> who you apparently all know. Uh, a member of the JD class of 2022, who was chosen by her classmates to make remarks today. Originally from Georgia, Skylar attended Alabama State University and received a bachelor's degree in social, social sciences education. 
She then attended Mississippi State University, where she earned a master's degree concentrating on American race relations and European revolutionary history. Before starting law school, Schuyler taught sixth grade social studies students in Georgia for two years. Here at Penn State Law, Schuyler was part of the Black Law Students Association, the Criminal Law Society, Women's Law Caucus, Corporate Law Society, Outlaw, and the National Balsa Moot Court Team. After law school, Schuyler will be practicing bankruptcy and commercial litigation at Banesh, Friedlander, Coplin, and Aronoff in Delaware. Please welcome Schuyler Morgan. Thank you so much, and thank you so much to our families for coming all the way out here to see us graduate. <laughs> thank you so much to the class of 2022 that voted for me to be the commencement speaker here today. I truly appreciate the honor. First, um, just so you know, although you picked me, I am not here to boost your egos. As <laughs> Your parents probably already know, uh, when we first came in, we were extremely smart. We had the highest GPAs and LSAT scores that the school had seen. Um, so I, we already know you're smart, we already know you're persistent, we already know that you're determined and you're gonna be amazing lawyers. So instead, I'm here to humble you and take us back to when we were baby 1Ls, when we were afraid to tell French our home state or states um, in the beginning of our 1L year, or you were rushing to Romero's class because you didn't want to get embarrassed on a cold call, or when we were stuck during final exam hours in the library trying to get a good seat to take a nap or a quiet place to find and read your book. So we came from a very long way and we were all very anxious and stressed and worried, but we made it. We made it here today. As two L's, we were overly confident. Um, <laughs> we came in thinking we finally got everything down. We're finally feeling comfortable. And then, well, even a little bit before two L, March, COVID happened. Um, and I remember um, when we were taking Professor Riley's class, I absolutely loved it because I had my boom moment, right? Finally figured out what I was gonna do. And then COVID happened and everything changed for all of us. However, instead of dwelling on the past, I'd like to recognize that for us, we changed in a great way after COVID as well. For us, we, gra we gave ourselves a community. We reached out to each other when times were hard. We began to prioritize our mental health and we grew even stronger and we were able to have some amazing conversations with each other. We became friends and we are very much going to continue to be family well after today. So I do have a small call to action for all of you all. I am encouraging each and every one of you all to live in your truth because there are a lot of groups of people that can currently not live in their truth. So for example, 37% of barred lawyers in 2021, they are women, but as we recognize with the Supreme Court's leak of their brief, we've been denied our, our reproductive rights. At, <laughs> Black people only make up 4.7% of all barred lawyers in America, yet in 12 states, we make up more than 50% of the prison population. 2.5% of Asian lawyers that are actually represented in America, um, they, they only make up 2.5%, excuse me. However, the problem is that over 10,900 incidents of, of anti-Asian um, crimes have happened in just this past year. Anti-trans hate is still very much alive and well, and we have the chance to change that by respecting other people's truths and protecting other people's truth. So as you leave here today, I want you to remember three things. First, as Professor Matthews told us, 
<laughs> Just remember you did this to yourself. <laughs> Second, <laughs> remember to always respect and protect other people's truths, even if it doesn't look like yours. And then third, <laughs> And third, we are. Love y'all, love y'all, thank you. Thank you, Skylar, for those terrific remarks. It has been a lot of fun to be with you all this morning together in one place. We haven't gotten to do that very often. And we get to do it here in Eisenhower Auditorium where we haven't been for commencement for three years. And I would like to, before we close, just ask you to take a moment to thank the Eisenhower staff who makes the event possible and works behind the scenes to make this good for you. It is a tradition at Penn State commencements and many other Penn State events to play the alma mater. The words are printed on the inside of the front cover of your program, so please stand for the playing of this special tribute to your university. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, and please be seated. This concludes our commencement ceremony for the class of 2022. We invite each of you to join us for a reception for our graduates and their guests at the Lewis Katz building immediately following the ceremony. We ask that the guests please remain seated until the recessional of the official party and the faculty is complete. Now, as the Dean of Penn State Law, I hereby declare the convocation closed. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.